So good evening, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Hello. Hi. Yes, thank you. Good. That's a good start. Yes. Uh, we'll just wait for a couple more people to um, show up and then we'll get started. Make yourself comfy. Uh, this is the first time that Willows has done this, so you will have to bear with me a little bit. Hopefully it will go seamlessly. Um, but if there are any technical issues, then please let me know. So I think we'll go ahead and make a start. Um, thank you all very much for coming to the first uh, radiology workshop evening film reading. This is uh, obviously in response to uh, the pandemic that nobody needs reminding about. Uh, we are trying to reach out to um, practitioners, practitioners to replace the, um, the real physical version of the radiology workshop that we normally do. So this, um, this radiology workshop, this remote radiology workshop will be continuing uh, for the period that the country's locked down uh, until we're able to run the physical workshops uh, that we run normally on the first Tuesday of every month. Um, just a few housekeeping uh, rules, if I may. Uh, if you're not speaking, if you could please mute your microphone, this just prevents background noise and the kind of feed la feedback loops that you might hear with these sorts of presenting software. If you want to ask a question, because there's quite a few people on, perhaps the best thing to do is if you could, um, if you could write it in the chat column, you'll see that there's an icon that says chat. If you click on that icon, you can write me a message and I will read it out and answer it. Uh, feel free to share your video, your camera, if you want to. Uh, these meetings are recorded so that we can send them to uh, practitioners who perhaps can't actually make the, make the, the meeting time itself. Um, so for those of you that are familiar with how this works, hopefully you can all see a, a page which says Radiology Workshop and today's date on it. Uh, is that correct? Yes, thanks, Andrew. Yeah. Good, that's a good start. That's an excellent start. So uh, you, you should have already received all these cases beforehand. Uh, what we're going to do is in exactly the same way as we do with the, the physical um, in-person workshops, is we, I'm going to allow you to choose a person between you who'd like to go through the case. Uh, if anybody's got any questions whilst, uh, whilst our colleague is going through the case, uh, if they can write them in the chat box. I will collect all those comments and then we can go through them afterwards. So we'll do that by case by case. So without further ado then, uh, who would like to do case one? Don't be shy now. I kind of start, Andrew. Perfect. So I recognize Caesar's voice there. So this is a two-year-old neutered male cockapoo. Uh, with a history of severe respiratory distress after going missing for a couple of hours. So, Cesar, go ahead. Okay, so we've got a uh, left and right lateral and a dorsoventral view of the thorax, including the cranial abdomen. Um, I think probably due to the dyspnea, the radiographs are possibly taken with minimal or no sedation. Uh, the laterals are slightly rotated and not perfectly collimated, and the front limbs are slightly uh, caudal um, and a little bit possibly underexposed, but overall, considering that the animal is in severe respiratory distress, I think they are quite good and of the diagnostic quality. Uh, on the right lateral view, there is an ill-defined radiolucent area ventral to the cardiac silhouette, displacing the later and the trachea dorsally, 
this area extends from the level of the third in the intercostal space um, to the kind of craniovendral border of the uh, diaphragm. And this is visible as well on a lesser extent on the left lateral view and on the dorsoventral on the lateral as aspect of both hemithorax, probably left a bit worse and with retraction of the caudal lung lobes. And there are several small pleural fissure lines, uh, for example, between the accessory lung lobe and the left caudal lung lobe, and between the re uh, right middle lung lobe and the right, right caudal lung lobe. On the dorsoventral view, at the level of T5, T6, in the middle of the left hemithorax, there is a kind of singular, well-defined, relatively large and rounded gas opacity structure uh, within the lung parenchyma. This structure is seen in both lateral views as well. On the right lateral, it's more conspicuous and it has kind of like thin walls. Over the ventral aspect of this structure, um, there is a small amount of soft tissue producing a soft tissue gas interface. Um, and I'm not completely sure if in, in that view it seems like it's sort of connected to the, the bronchial tree maybe, but I'm not completely sure. Um, there are another two small but similar in appearance uh, structures at the level of the seventh rib on the left hemithorax and a fourth less well-defined but similar lesion caudal to the first one at the level of T8, uh, T9 on the left side. And there is a generalized increase of tissue opacity of all lung lobes uh, with visible air bronchograms, uh, left, towards and right, I think. Um, the cardiac silhouette is normal in size and has a slightly disabled on the dorsoventral view, but I think this might be potentially artifactual. Um, there is a mild mediastinal shift to the right, and the mediastinum seems to be normal and is not widened, I think. And there is a mild amount of gas within the esophagus and the visible pulmonary vasculature, lymph nodes, soft tissues and skeletal structures are within normal limits. On the abdomen, the fundus and the pylorus are mildly to moderately distended by gas and there is a slightly reduced aerosol detail on the left lateral view on the craniodorsal abdomen. So in conclusion, I think there is an alveolar pattern um, which um, could be due to trauma and so hemorrhage um, or some sort of pneumonia, neoplasia or acute uh, respiratory distress syndrome. Uh, these pulmonary lesions, I, this was the hardest case, I think, um, but I think they might represent either bullas or blebs or potentially bullous emphysema or potentially neoplasia uh, and abscess, but th there is, the, the walls are quite thin, um, or granulomas. And there is mild pneumothorax and mild pleural effusion, likely a consequence of the rupture of any of those structures. Um, so, I mean, considering that it's a young dog um, that has been lost, I think trauma is a possibility. So, um, yeah, some like hemorrhage with like ruptured bulla producing um, pleural effusion and um, pneumothorax. But yeah, I, I haven't ever seen this kind of structures with this like soft tissue air interface. So potentially, I think that could be maybe blood or like yeah another of those structures. So I think uh, probably a CT of the chest would be good to have a, a better idea of what's going on. Very very good. Does anybody else have anything to add? I think that was an extraordinary report. Well done, Caesar. So let's just go through um, uh, through these radiographs. So it's a young dog, um, and we've got a, a history where we don't really know what's happened to the patient for a couple of hours before they presented with severe respiratory distress. And so I guess in a young patient, we would be we would already be perhaps slightly concerned about some sort of traumatic um, history. Um, as Caesar's discussed here, so there, there are a number of changes on these radiographs um, uh, which we can all see. The first one, um, probably the most obvious one, is the patient has a pneumothorax. So on this left lateral radiograph, we know it's a left lateral radiograph because we can see there's gas in the pylorus of the stomach here. Uh, so that for us makes it a, a left lateral radiograph. On the right lateral radiograph, 
we expect to see gas in the uh, in the dorsal aspect of the stomach, the fundus up here. Um, so on this left lateral radiograph, we can see that there is a gas interface between the ventral aspect of the cardiac silhouette um, and the sternum. We can also see that the uh, at least one of the lungs is withdrawn, retracted away from the margins of the um, of the thorax, and we can see this here. So this is a clear indication that the patient has pneumothorax, um, and we've got at least one collapsed lung and a volume of uh, of, gas, of gas free in the, the pleural cavity. Um, so already we're starting to think about something traumatic and certainly the presence of a pneumothorax uh, would fit with that very nicely. So let's pick off the easy bits first. Can, do, the, do the rest of the radiographic findings on the other studies, do they fit with that? Uh, and on this, on this right lateral radiograph, again, we've got retraction of the, of the cardiac silhouette from the body wall, and it's replaced with a small pocket of, of, uh, of pleural gas. So fitting very nicely with the, with the contralateral radiograph. And on the dorsal ventral radiograph, uh, again, we can see evidence of retraction of the lung lobes away from the uh, body wall, slightly asymmetric. And on this dorsal ventral radiograph, we can see that there's more gas on the left side than there is on the right side. We can also see, as Caesar says, that, that the, the cardiac silhouette isn't quite in the normal position. And the base of the cardiac silhouette, and the, sorry, the apex of the cardiac silhouette has been displaced over to the right hand side. So if you remember, normally we'd expect the apex of the heart to sit just to the left of the midline. In this particular situation, um, the heart is slightly rotated and moved over to the right hand side. So this would suggest that there's something space occupying in the left um, hemithorax um, and that would fit with the presence of more gas on the left than there is on the right. So we've done all the easy bits now. Now we've got to move on to the slightly harder bits. And the harder bits are uh, this kind of manifestation of a, of a, of a sort of ellipsoid gas-filled pocket superimposed on an increase in opacity throughout the, the majority of the lung fields that are superimposed on the cardiac silhouette. So those would be the caudal and the middle or the left caudal part of the cranial lobes um, of, the, of the lungs. On the right lateral radiograph, we can see a much more distinct shaped, uh, kind of ellipsoid shaped structure. It's mostly gas filled. It has a variably thick wall and the ventral aspect of it has a much larger thickness of soft tissue. And it's got this kind of meniscus appearance, a little bit like putting water into a, uh, into a cup. You so say the, the edges of the water are higher than the central portion. So this is called a meniscus sign in, in radiographs. And we can see that there are several other smaller structures like this uh, throughout, the, throughout the pulmonary parenchyma. Do we know definitively that these are pulmonary parenchymal lesions? It's very hard to say. Um, but it's hard to imagine what else they could be in. It, it'd be very unusual for pleural gas to pocket like this without an obvious amount of, uh, of pleural fluid. And pleural fluid doesn't seem to be um, a very obvious characteristic of these radiographs. So, so far, what have we got? We've got a pneumothorax, uh, which is slightly bigger on the left than the right, and we've got these odd-shaped gas-filled lesions uh, that have some sort of meniscus in them that suggests that there may be a quantity of fluid uh, as well as gas present. Uh, so those are two, those are the first two radiographic findings. And then the next thing that Caesar talked about is this increased opacity throughout the lung fields. Now we know that when we retract the lung fields because of a pneumothorax, we're effectively causing atelectasis, and atelectasis is a reduction in the volume of lung, uh, typically secondary to an absence of aeration. The most common time that we see this, of course, is when we take radiographs, uh, we sedate our patient, we lie them on in lateral recumbency, and then if you take a dorsal ventral radiograph afterwards, you'll see that there's a mediastinal shift towards the side that the patient's been lying on, and the lung in that dependent aspect has increased in opacity. So we see this quite regularly, uh, so-called positional atelectasis. So certainly a portion of this increase in opacity 
is going to be secondary to the retraction in the uh, the lungs from the uh, margins of the thoracic cavity. Um, but to my eye, at least, this is much worse than what we would normally expect with um, uh, with a pneumothorax. So we know that patients that sustain trauma will often have uh, pulmonary contusions, so bleeding and hemorrhage and, and uh, edema spreading throughout the lung uh, fields, and that will manifest as an alveolar pattern. And if you look closely, particularly at this dorsoventral radiograph, you'll see in this portion of the, this is the right middle lobe here, we can start to see that there are a few little air bronchograms here. So from the radiographs, we can be reasonably convinced, I think, that this is probably traumatic, that we have a pneumothorax which is asymmetric, that there's evidence of diffuse increase in lung opacity which may suggest pulmonary contusion, and we've got these odd uh, gas and fluid-filled structures particularly affecting uh, the left um, lung and uh, of the cranial lobe uh, and the left caudal lobe. So given that collection of findings, these are probably going to be uh, pulmonary bully. Uh, we know that we see traumatic pulmonary bully, uh, and this is a, a manifestation of trauma that we sometimes see. So a shearing injury to the, uh, to the alveoli of the, um, of the lung, uh, which causes them to form these uh, little pockets. So um, clearly we need a little bit more information on this and certainly in some cases where there's a severe pulmonary tear uh, and a continuous pneumothorax, uh, we may wish to consider um, a thoracotomy for further investigation. So if that's something that's on the cards, then the next thing to do, as Caesar suggested, is, uh, is consider doing a, a CT scan. So uh, I'm not quite sure how well this will translate for you. On the left hand side of your image you should see it, there's a dorsal so-called MPR, multiplanar reconstruction of the lung. So this is just a still image and on the right hand side you should see that I'm scrolling through the chest. Hopefully that's coming out for you okay. So you can see that indeed the pulmonary parenchyma is increased in opacity. So this is the left cranial lobe, it's relatively normal. The right cranial lobe is increased in opacity, and you've got this um, these kind of air bronchograms. These are what air bronchograms are, so an increase in the opacity of the alveoli, and then the bronchus superimposed full of, of normal gas. As we scroll through the CT a bit further, starting to see on the uh, on the right side that there's a pneumothorax. Uh, that's this pocket of gas just here. And then, indeed, there's a larger volume of pneumothorax on the left side. This is a pneumothorax here. And then we're starting to see, so we didn't see this on, at least I didn't see this on the radiograph, little lesions with gas in the centre, and then a kind of soft tissue, attenu we call it attenuation on C2, soft tissue attenuation around it. Um, and then we can see much a much larger one on the left hand side, which is distorting the shape of the lung. Uh, and as we continue to go through, we can see another one just here, which is the kind of classic appearance of a bulla. Here's the meniscus that we were talking about. So the ventral, this patient's in, ster in sternal recumbency, so the ventral aspect of this bullus is filled, of this bulla is filled with, with blood, with soft tissue attenuating material. The dorsal aspect is full of gas, and you can see really clearly how uh, this could very easily cause a pneumothorax. So you've just got a very thin frond of, of visceral pleura uh, keeping that bulla um, intact. And as we scroll through, we can see there's a few more in the caudal aspect of the lung, but really multiple uh, little traumatic pulmonary bully. So these patients actually do reasonably well, provided you can control uh, their pneumothorax. And in this patient, we managed to control the pneumothorax uh, with uh, 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 pleural drains. Um, and if you do need to CT these patients later on or want to CT these patients later on, typically between five and 10 days post-trauma, 
these bullae actually collapse and disappear of their own accord. Um, so large pulmonary bullae of their own um, of their own presentation isn't necessarily an indication for thoracotomy and isn't necessarily an indication for lung, lo lung lobectomy. It's really how the patient manages with them. So if there's a consistent um, uh, pneumothorax that you can't control with drainage, uh, then it's an indication that surgical intervention might be necessary. Lovely case, very well presented, Caesar. Thank you very much. Anybody got, got any questions on that? Okay, so let's move on to case two. Do you mind if I turn the music up so I can listen to this phone? Uh, I'm going to presume that wasn't aimed at me. If you can hear music, it's not coming from my end. Uh, case two is a 12-year-old male Jack Russell Terrier. has a six-week history of uh, urinary tract problems and they're getting worse despite um, a reasonably robust uh, antibiotic course. Do I have any volunteers to have a go at this one? Yeah. Don't be shy now. Caesar's done the hard one. Anybody at all want to have a go? Yeah, I'll have a go at Simon here. Hi. Hi. Simon, it's great to great to virtually see you. It's been a while. I hope you're well. <laughs> oh, I, I could do real, but nobody wants to see that. Nobody wants to see that. Okay. And I, I'm slightly in awe of Caesar. Uh, that was that was quite amazing. That was that was that was truly a fantastic presentation. I'll give this a go. I'm I'm very rusty. Um, okay, so we've got a right lateral and um, uh, it's, a, it's a ventrodorsal, I presume it's ventrodorsal looking at the, the way the pelvis is of the, um, of the abdomen of this Jack Russell Terrier. So we know it's a Jack Russell Terrier. It's definitely male because we've got the penis there. It's well exposed. It's, how old is this Jack Russell? 12 years old. That's right. There we go. Um, so we can see that within the abdomen, going through the structures of the belly, we can see that there's some gas in the, in the colon which is extending quite cranially and then to some normal sort of um, mixed density typical of fecal matter or ingester in the colon. Um, we see small intestine appears to have been displaced cranially by a large soft tissue density which I presume to be the, the shadow of the bladder. At least that's my presumption, initial presumption. Um, and just caudal to what I'm presuming to be the bladder, I can just see a soft tissue density just, just in front of the pelvis on the lateral view, which could possibly in the, in the region of the prostate. It didn't say it's the entire male. It just says male. Right. Now, um, stomach uh, doesn't appear anything unusual in the stomach. Uh, kidneys can't really see those particularly well on the lateral view. And... Yeah, I'm reading this on the fly. Um, and on the ventrodorsal view, um, yeah, I can see, can I see a kidney there? Possibly not. Okay. Um, the, on the ventrodorsal view, I can see that the colon is displaced over to the left. And the um, there is a markedly radiodense structure to the left side of the lower lumbar spine, sort of L6, L7 region. Um, which looks very soft tissue, but it's quite radiodense, which is curious. And beyond that, the, the structure of the bones looks absolutely fine. And there's a little bit of um, spondylosis uh, below the lumbar spine on the lateral view on, on at, uh, L7 and L4, I think. I think. Um, yeah. Apart from that, I'm thinking possibly this is. I'm concerned about this being prostatic, but I'm a little bit confused by it. Sorry to say. And 
I wondered whether we got some kind of prostatic problem causing out problems to the outflow of the bladder, which then leads to the bladder not being able to empty properly, which is why it's so distended. That was my view on this. I think I want to ultrasound next. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Simon. Does anybody else have anything to add? Now is your time. We're obviously quite a shy lot tonight, aren't we? Hopefully we'll warm into it. Okay, thanks, Simon. That was that was excellent. So um, the history is is suggesting to us um, that uh, that this patient has a urinary tract issue. Uh, it's unclear what that urinary tract issue is. Um, and of course, we should never really forget abdominal radiographs. Radi radiographs, in particular abdominal thoracic radiographs, are incredibly useful um, before we dive straight into ultrasound um, uh, or if those who have access to it at CT. I really do think that radiographs will very often give you the answer with abdominal disease, particularly urinary tract disease, um, without needing anything else. Uh, so as Simon quite reasonably has said that we can see this um, kind of ellipsoid shaped soft tissue opacity uh, just cranial to the to the pelvic inlet. Uh, it's well demarcated, it's quite rounded. You get the impression that where it engages the pelvic brim, the descending colon which is gas filled directly dorsal to it is actually narrowed. Um, and then we've also got a bladder which is pretty chunky for a for a um, a, a, a canine patient. This would be a, a, a large bladder uh, and we have a history of plaquiuria. So we're expecting that maybe um, uh, th there's a possibility that the reason the bladder is large is because the outflow of the bladder is being obstructed some way. Uh, of course, if we'd seen a smaller bladder or very small bladder, then perhaps with that sort of history, we might be thinking more along the lines of something like cystitis where our patients wants to void urine far more frequently. Uh, that doesn't entirely fit with the history with, with this patient. Um, as Simon says, the kidneys look, look pretty normal so far as we can tell. We can see uh, the silhouette of the left kidney just here. It's superimposed on the, on the descending colon so we can see it. Uh, we can just about see the caudal pole of the right kidney uh, just here, uh, not really giving us an awful lot of um, information on the kidneys, uh, but nothing to suggest here that the kidneys are abnormal. Um, and then Simon's talked about this um, this increased radiopaque structure just lying to the left side of the uh, of the lumbar spine. Does anybody want to hazard a guess as to what that is? Okay, so this is. Um, this is a common artifact that we see. This is actually the prep, prep use of this patient. So a male patient, because the prep usage is only soft tissue, but is surrounded by gas, it will, it'll often look much, much more opaque than you might expect it to. And the way to just prove that is just find the os penis and the os penis you'll see is running right up the middle of it. So that confirms that this is definitely our prep use. Um, so we're just having a few um, people making comments on the chat. Uh, saying that the bladder is perhaps a little bit cordally displaced um, and dorsally displaced away from the ventral body wall. So I think that's that's probably a bit of a subjective finding. Certainly with, with very large prostates, uh, you might expect them to kind of push the, the, the neck of the bladder ventrally towards the body wall. Um, but I think probably this bladder is in, in the right position. It's just far too big. Okay, so the prostate is, so far what we've got is the prostate is questionably a bit enlarged um, and the bladder is definitely a little bit on the big side. So a couple of things just to follow up with, with those two things. With prostate size, how big is too big? This is, there are a number of measurements that you can make for prostatic size, none of which are even, even vaguely accurate. So prostatic size in itself is not a reliable indicator of disease. Uh, and don't forget, especially with, with entire male patients, it's usual to have a reasonably large prostate, especially as they get older, uh, because this is a, a, a manifestation of benign prostatic hyperplasia, which is largely considered to be a normal uh, age-related process in, in entire male dogs. So prostatic size, unless it's particularly large, 
often won't tell you very much about disease. One other thing that we look for with, pros with uh, prostate is mineralization, and mineralization will tell us a lot about disease. Uh, we expect to see mineralization uh, with neoplasia, but not always, and we'll expect to see mineralization with abscessation of the prostate, but again, not always. So if we see it, it's a good indication of disease. If we don't see it, it's not necessarily meaning that disease is absent. There's something else going on on these radiographs, though, that really helps us. Has anybody else spotted anything else outside the prostate, perhaps along the spine, that is not normal? So I'll put you out of your misery. So uh, very reasonably, we'll often see spondylosis deformans in elderly patients. Um, this is an asymptomatic or typically asymptomatic accumulation of smooth new bone, typically along the ventral aspects of the vertebral bodies, most pronounced by the uh, vertebral end plates and next to the intervertebral disc spaces. On here, however, we've got a very irregular, poorly defined, um, uh, extensive periosteal reaction, so mineralization extending away from the vertebral bodies uh, and extending really along the entire length of the caudal lumbar spine. And also, actually, if you look carefully, there's little changes on the coccygeal vertebrae and along the ventral aspect of the sacrum. So this is not a normal accumulation of bone. This is an abnormal and indeed pathological accumulation of bone or accumulation of, of uh, periosteal new bone. Um, and we see this very regularly in patients that have malignant pelvic disease. Um, and the reason for it uh, is um, this is not something that we just see with prostatic neoplasia. It can happen with, with a number of other types of pelvic neoplasia, um, particularly anal sac uh, neoplasia. And the reason that we get these changes, um, which uh, are a manifestation of vertebral metastatic disease, so vertebral mets, the reason we get these is because of the way that the patient's dealing with the disease. So what happens when, uh, when patients have, in particular, lower urinary tract disease or, or terminal rectal or anal sac disease, is they'll tend to strain to pass feces and urine and if they strain they increase the pressure in their abdomen. If you increase the pressure in your abdomen, particularly if you do it for long periods of time and dogs abuse when, they're, when they have prostatic disease in particular, they'll be straining and straining away for ages. You increase the abdominal pressure, you close down the normal uh, method of venous return to the heart. So the caudal vena cava uh, all you have to do is increase pressure over central venous pressure, which is very low, and the caudal vena cava will squash down. Um, and what, we, what, what will normally happen is that the blood coming from the pelvis will have a, a, another way to get back to the heart. And the way that it will do that is obviously through the azygous vein, but also through the basivertebral venous plexuses. So the basivertebral venous plexuses you can't squash them because they're encased in bone. But the problem with them is blood tends to flow very slowly through them. And metastatic cells, so neoplastic cells, will settle out of blood very easily if blood flow is very slow. And so we tend to see periosteal disease like this, so metastatic bone cancer uh, in the caudal aspect of the lumbar spine because of this reason. So in patients with pelvic disease, because they're straining a lot. And it's a phenomenon called the Valsalva phenomenon. Um, so it's a really good rule of thumb. If you're concerned about um, pelvic disease, in particular anal sac disease and prostatic disease, have a good look at the, the ventral aspects of the caudal lumbar spine and convince yourself that if there's any new bone there, that it is in fact normal spondylosis, benign, well demarcated, smoothly demarcated new bone uh, and not something potentially more aggressive. So indeed this patient based on the radiographic findings has likely got a, a bladder neck, so bladder outflow obstruction caused by an enlarged prostate and unfortunately for, for this little chap already has evidence of metastatic disease.
So here's an ultrasound. So it's quite curious. The, the bladder, the, so this is a hopefully, well, hopefully you can orientate yourselves, but you see that here's the bladder, here's the prostate. Prostate looks on ultrasound like it is slightly mineralized. Uh, don't forget that ultrasound will pick up mineralization much more acutely than radiographs will. But actually, the prostate itself, it's not terribly abnormal in shape and it's not terribly enlarged. And this is not unusual with, with um, prostatic carcinoma, that they'll met very readily in the disease and very early in the disease uh, before a patient really suffers with the, um, with the primary site disease that, that we would expect. Very good. Thank you very much. Anybody have any questions on case two? Good. OK, let's move on to case three. So does anybody want to have a go at case three? Are we all still there? I lulled you into. I'm still here. Yeah. False sense of security. I'm going to have to start picking on people. You see, the problem is I can see all you. I don't know whether you can see you, but I can see all you. So uh, let's pick on Pip. Is Pip there to take case three? I am, Andrew, but I confess I was hoping to sit at the back and watch, so I haven't actually looked for the case. It'll be a bit of a free, free, freestyle. Okay, well. well, that sounds good to me. I'm sorry to put you on the spot. Let's see how Thank you. you. Uh, so we have a one-year-old male new domestic short-haired cat with progressive paroxysmal sneezing episodes and nasal discharge deteriorating over a period of three weeks. Um, so here we have a rostrocaudal um, of the skull, um, leasing mature cat. Um, Positioning wise, I think it's actually quite straight and very, very mild amount of rotation, but it's definitely diagnostic. Um, I'm quite well collimated. Um, so, do we have any other views? Is it just this view, Andrew? Okay, and a right lateral lateral of the skull and cervical spine as well. Can we just go back to the rostral caudal? Thank you. Um, so, just starting with the sort of most obvious features, you can see that there is um, within the ventromedial um, aspect of the tympanic bulla, there's a slight sort of increase in soft tissue slash mineralized opacity. Uh, it's quite heterogeneous um, throughout the medial aspect of the ventromedial compartment. Um, and possibly also the dorsolateral compartment when compared to the contralateral side. Um, other than that, I think the external acoustic meters look on the ATI look quite clear bilaterally. Um, I'm not seeing any other sort of abnormalities with regards to the mandible, though obviously it's quite foreshortened on this view. Um, can we just head back to the 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 lateral? Thank you. Um, so again, slight rotation, but I think it's quite overall nice view. Um, I think there's you can see the same sort of soft tissue opacity within the bullet, which are now superimposed on each other. Um, and there's also quite a homogeneous, um, broad-based um, soft tissue opacity that's um, just in the region of the oropharynx, sort of causing a ventral deviation of the sort of air column there. Um, that's sort of extending back to about, so it's extending from the level of the caudal maxilla um, up to the sort of halfway through the bulla, I'd say. Um, 
and otherwise don't see any huge other abnormalities on this view um just have a look throughout the cervical spine so that all looks quite nice um and the rest of the skull mandible and teeth look okay um can we go back to the rust recorder sorry um I suppose we've also got uh, just, it might just be a bit of dirt in the coat, a uh, very small um, mineralized opacity just on the left, so towards the left um, of the um, angle of the left mandible. Um, obviously, you can't measure it, but it's sort of quite a rectangular, sharply marginated um, mineral opacity just there. Um, I'm just trying to think. I suppose it's sort of mostly me. Um, just trying to sort of think if I think there's any abnormalities further in the skull, but I think obviously it's quite hazy. I rarely look at skull radiographs these days. Um, Aside from the bullet changes, so you probably extrapolate on those as a slight expansion of the right bullet compared to the left, um, possibly slight thickening of the bullet walls um, as well. Um, I'm not spotting any obvious soft tissue mass. This probably way will just laugh at me afterwards. Um, and. So yeah, I think I'll probably conclude there before I get myself into trouble. Um, I think that we have obviously right, so unilateral right-sided um, bullet changes, which are probably consistent with a chronic otitis media. Um, so we've sort of got the expansion and um, sclerosis, heterogeneity of the bullet here. And if we just go to the laterals, Again, um, I think quite possibly what's causing the deviation here of the um, soft palate, as I sort of described before, um, sort of soft, soft tissue opacity here, which could be caused um, due to mass effect from, say, a polyps or um, other type of sort of tumor um, that you get within this region. Um, of squamous cell carcinoma or um, although I'm not seeing a lot of lysis floating to it um, I'm not seeing anything um, which doesn't make me think of any sort of inner ear tumour um, cholesteatoma etc um, so I think probably most likely polyps with a chronic cotitis media would probably be my my main differential here yeah. but you can put me out of your misery my misery very good. Anybody else have anything to add? Looks like Simon may have something to add. Uh, he's reported that he may have seen one of these back, well, back when I was virtually not even a vet back in 2000. So I think we're probably all thinking about the same thing. That was very good, Pip. Well done. So uh, I'm sorry to put you on the spot like that, especially if you haven't had time to look at the radiographs first. So, um, so, <laughs> so we've got a young patient here. It's only a year old. Um, it's been sneezing, nasal discharge, and it's getting worse. Um, so obviously the lateral radiograph is the one that we're more used to looking at. Um, and on this lateral radiograph, um, we can see that uh, whilst the oral cavity looks completely normal, the soft palate is bulging ventrally 
and the normal gaseous nasopharynx is blind ending. So it stops suddenly and then we don't see any more gas extending rostrally into the caudal aspect of the nasal cavity as we'd expect. So this is strongly suggested then that there is some sort of soft tissue opacity mass that's occupying the nasopharynx, a portion of the nasopharynx. The other thing that we, we try to use the lateral radiographs for is to look at the uh, tympanic bully. Um, on this radiograph, the tympanic bully are virtually perfectly superimposed, so it's a very nice lateral radiograph. Um, normally what we would do to assess the tympanic bully is to, to introduce a, a level of obliquity so we can, we can highlight or skyline uh, one radiograph, uh, sorry, one tympanic bully before the other. But you get the impression at least that the tympanic bulla is filled with something that isn't quite just air. I, there may be a portion of soft tissue associated with it. We then more, move on to this radiograph. So this is the so-called rostrocaudal open mouth radiograph. This radiograph is really used specifically to look at the tympanic bully. Um, and there are two ways that we can do that in cats. Uh, we can either use the rostral caudal open mouth view, which is, which is this radiograph. These are technically challenging radiographs to get. Uh, the patient is positioned in dorsal recumbency with a neck at about uh, 90 degree angle. And then we have to try and open the mouth as much as possible to try and get these tympanic bullies superimposed on the caudal aspect of the skull. An easier way to do it is to do the rostrocaudal oblique closed mouth view which as the name suggests, you're going to close the mouth and actually just tip up the chin a little bit so that the tympanic bully in cats at least project ventral to the mandible uh, and you have a reasonable chance of actually seeing their content. So much easier. You don't see anywhere near as much of the bulla when you use that technique, but it's a technically much easier radiograph to produce. Nonetheless, on this radiograph, we can see that on the left-hand side, we can see the ventromedial and dorsolateral aspects of the tympanic bulla look completely normal, very, very thin margins of bone and predominantly filled with gas. Whereas on the right, there's a suspicion, as Pip says, that the wall of the bulla is thickened and even the partition between the ventromedial portion and the dorsolateral portion is thickened. And you've got an increase in the amount of soft tissue opacity in this bulla. So putting that all together, so we've got a, a, a mass within the nasopharynx and a soft tissue opacity within the right tympanic bulla. In a very young patient, these would be suggestive of a nasopharyngeal polyp. And the nasopharyngeal polyps can either grow within the tympanic bulla or they grow within the little tiny auditory tube or eustachian tube that connects the bulla to the uh, nasopharynx or they grow within the nasopharynx. Um, and it's not easy to tell that. In fact, it's not possible to tell where they originate uh, based on the radiographs. You can get a little bit of an idea of this on CT because you can see if they're pedunculated in which direction they've grown from. In the vast majority of cases, it's not really uh, relevant. Uh, the polyp needs to come out one way or the other uh, to free the patient from disease. We can probably hazard a guess that this has been going on for a little while, and that's why we've got thickening of the walls of the tympanic bulla on the right. Uh, so there's probably a degree of otitis media in this patient as well. And that's probably the reason for the clinical signs that we've seen. Good, thank you very much. Let's move on to case four. I think as we're running a little bit late, I will take this one. I suspect we haven't got a huge number of volunteers by the looks of things anyway. So case four, this is a 14 year old male neutered domestic short haired cat with a history of weight loss, a history of increased respiratory, uh, sorry, resting respiratory effort and occasional vomiting episodes. So we're concerned therefore about both abdominal disease and thoracic disease. Uh, and here is the radiograph, so thoracic radiographs of our feline patient, and we've got a, a left lateral, right lateral radiograph, uh, and then a slightly oblique, slightly rotated dorsoventral radiograph. Um, and depending on how you, how you take apart these radiographs, um, I would suggest that when you're interpreting radiographs like this, the best thing to do is describe the things that you see first. 
Um, there are a number of methods on how we interpret radiographs, um, and there are a number of, of uh, publications describing how we t interpret radiographs. But really, your eye is being drawn to something. And the best thing to do, and the most accurate way of dealing with a radiograph, is describe the thing that your eye is being drawn to first. So for me, I can see a fairly large soft tissue opacity. It's a poorly defined soft tissue opacity. I can't see the margins of it, but it's centered on the uh, of the carina of the trachea. So it's projecting cordally beyond the trachea and it's it's encircling the trachea's um, caudal aspect, so terminal aspect. The cardiac silhouette looks relatively unremarkable, so it suggests to me that this is not um, uh, an enlargement of the left atrium, which might appear in this, in this region. It suggests to me that it's an extra cardiac structure. On top of that, I can also see that the, uh, the thoracic trachea is being displaced dorsally, and there's an increase in thickness of the soft tissue of the cranial mediastinum ventral to it. So dorsal displacement of the trachea in this region, we do see this as a normal finding from time to time, especially if the patient's neck is ventriflexed, so you've got a kind of concertinering of the trachea, if you like, um, but that doesn't seem to be uh, uh, that doesn't seem to be um, what's going on in this case. We also get the impression that over the third sternebra, there's just a slight increase in soft tissue opacity in this region here. Um, when we look at the dorsal ventral radiograph, we're really looking for information that, that corroborates our story. So indeed, cardiac silhouette looks approximately normal in size, but there's a poorly defined increase in soft tissue opacity associated with the uh, the base of the cardiac silhouette. We can't really see the trachea terribly easily on this radiograph, but it doesn't look like it's displaced either to the left or to the right. And then further cranially, we can see that the cranial mediastinum is widened. We've got this well-defined margin to the cranial mediastinum on the left, on the right, and a slightly poorer defined margin to the cranial mediastinum on the right. In either case, taking up a greater width of the um, of the thorax at this level than we'd expect. Again, lots of measurements are available to try to give you an idea of what's normal for the uh, cranial mediastinum, um, and approximately the width of two vertebrae as a maximum uh, would be what you're aiming for. In many patients, it's much, much smaller than that. In some patients, particularly bulldogs and patients with a large amount of thoracic fat, um, it will be quite a lot more than that. So the radiographs are telling us that we have um, uh, the presence of a cranial mediastinal mass, uh, the potential for enlargement of the sternal lymph nodes that live in this region, and also um, uh, enlargement of the perihylar lymph nodes. And the reason for those particular changes, or those, those being our differentials, is those are the, the most likely structures that are going to live uh, in those areas, and it fits very nicely if we can link all that pathology together. One thing we haven't looked at or spent any time describing is what's going on south of the diaphragm, and certainly we can see what we might expect to be, um, uh, well, what is an increase in, in the soft tissue opacity mass of the cranial abdominal structures. On the very edge of this left lateral radiograph, we can see the pylorus, which is just here. And so we can see that the gastric axis, which is a line in this direction, is just tilted slightly cordally. We'd expect in um, skin intel cats it to be much more upright, more perpendicular to the spine, uh, and at an absolute maximum, we'd expect it to be about parallel with the ribs. So this is, this is suggestive um, that there's a cranial abdominal structure um, soft tissue structure that's enlarged and of course uh, what I'm pandering away at is the possibility that the liver is enlarged. Um, here's our dorsal ventral radiograph so we've got gas in the stomach just on the edge of the radiograph uh, so that makes all of this liver and that liver is too big. So now when we put those findings together we've got um, uh, tracheobronchial lymphadenopathy, cranial mediastinal lymphadenopathy, sternal lymphadenopathy, and hepatomegaly. Uh, really, there aren't many differentials for, uh, for that kind of multifocal disease. And of course, in this country with our patients, 
uh, we'd expect lymphoma to be the most likely. Does anybody have any questions on this case? No, thanks, Andrew. That's absolutely perfect. It's, yeah. So uh, one question that's been asked is whether this, this could be possibly thymoma. And a thymoma is a really good suggestion. So well done for coming up with that. Um, of course, thymoma is a, is a very reasonable differential for a cranial mediastinal mass. When there's more than one mass, though, and especially when there's also a sternal lymphadenopathy, hepatomegaly, and the perihylal lymphadenopathy, that makes uh, thymoma slightly less um, less likely. Okay, I'm conscious of time, so we will move on. So case five is a seven-year-old male neutered German shepherd with a progressive right pelvic limb namus for about three weeks, a limited response to rest and, and painkillers. Does anybody want to have a go at this one? Uh, I'm happy to have a go. Great, the floor's all yours, go ahead. Okay, um, so we've got um, left and right lateral and craniocaudal views of um, Diefel uh, in a skeletally mature uh, large breed dog. Um, so I would say looking at the comparison uh, on the lateral views um, that the left um, looks relatively within normal limits. Um, so the bony surfaces are smooth, there's a normal trabecular pattern, um, etc. Um, but the right, um, you can see uh, increased soft tissue opacity in the joint space. Um, and the normal trabecular pattern of the um, uh, sort of ends of the, the bones um, is a little bit um, disrupted. Um, it looks a little bit more uneven than on the left, um, but I would say it's quite subtle on that view. Um, but if you look on the craniocaudal, it's a lot more obvious. So you've got these areas of um, sclerosis and um, sort of loss, loss of mineralization as well. Um, and that's both above and below the joint. Um, so in the femur and the tibia and fibula. Um, and again, it looks like there's a widened joint space on that right one compared to the left. Um, I don't know how uh, accurate that is. Um, it could be position dependent, but um, there could also be um, increased uh, fluid in the joint space there, potentially. Um, will that do? Uh, let me That's see. That's fantastic. Yeah, thank you very much. Anybody have any other comments? So I think that was a really lovely description. Thank you very much. Um, quite subtle changes here, I think, uh, which is why I chose these radiographs. And I think if you didn't have the left radiograph, they would be much, much more difficult to interpret. So I guess one of the one of the take home points from this study is when we're dealing with um, uh, appendicular skeletal abnormalities that are quite subtle, there's absolutely no harm in radiographing the co contralateral limb to give you something normal uh, to compare it to. Um, so um, we can see uh, there are a number of findings that, uh, uh, I think that was Claire, wasn't it? I think that was Claire, uh, that, that Claire has described here. Andrea, actually. <laughs> Sorry, Andrea, I do apologize, yeah. Um, so uh, a number of, a number of um, uh, changes that Andrea has described here. So on the lateral radiographs, the first thing that you can see is, um, and, and again, this might be because of a difference in uh, exposure technique, but it appears that there's more soft tissue associated with the right stifle than there is with the left stifle. It appears that it's a little bit thicker, or at the very least, it's a slightly different shape. When you look at the cranial aspect of the tibia, uh, as Andrea has said, you can see that the, the, the well demarcated regions of the epiphysis and the uh, metaphysis on the left aren't, uh, aren't mimicked on the right. 
it's harder to see the difference between the metaphysis and the epiphysis. And you also get the impression that the bone density is less uniform. So we can see that there are regions that are relatively osteopenic here, here, a piece here, for example, another piece here. And then overall, there are also regions that appear to be slightly more sclerotic. If you take this as our normal, it just looks clean and pristine, doesn't it? The, the um, tibial tuberosity is much thinner as you'd expect, uh, so the, the, the bone is almost radiolucent here. Also, there looks like, as Andrea said, that there's an increase in synovial mass here. So what I mean by that is there's more synovial soft tissue opacity uh, on the right than there is the left. On the left, we can see there's a very small synovial mass which really just makes up the menisci, uh, the intrasynovial uh, ligaments and a small amount of synovial fluid. When we move on to the, um, onto the craniocaudal view, um, the changes look a little bit more obvious. So uh, again, we can see these regions of osteolysis, particularly affecting the, um, the, the proximal aspect of the tibia. And you almost get the impression that actually the, the fibula is not quite the same, the right opacity. Although, again, uh, this is something that we just need to take with a little bit of a pinch of salt. Um, the fibula is a relatively radiolucent structure anyway, uh, so that can be easily misleading. And we also get the impression that there are some regions that are relatively osteopenic in the distal femur, as Andrea said. You need to just be a little bit careful about this. Um, this patient has uh, changes that are suggestive of degenerative joint disease in the right as well. So we can see that if you look at the patella in particular, it's slightly misshapen. The fabelli have little enthesophytes associated with them, and the tibial plateau is slightly roughened and irregular compared to the left side. So there's the possibility then that these changes actually are a manifestation of degenerative joint disease and not a manifestation of anything else. And for me, if I had to point to where this lesion was originating, we would be talking right, right about here. So that would make this a proximal metaphyseal tibial lesion. And if it's a proximal metaphyseal tibial lesion, there's really two things that we're worried about. One is a primary bone tumour, and one is a soft tissue tumour that's invading bone in this region. And in a German Shepherd dog, it would be in that order, so primary bone tumour first. But I think you'll agree that these changes are very, very subtle. They're probably aggressive because we're seeing evidence of osteolysis, uh, and they're certainly real, but we just have to remember that radiographs really dramatically underestimate disease in these sorts of situations. Bone has to lose about 60% of its mineral content before we're going to get any sort of impression of seeing something uh, on radiographs. So clearly uh, another option would be to do CT uh, and CT is not available for everybody and in many cases CT is not appropriate. In particular where CT is not appropriate is if something else has happened, something else that we can relatively easily test for before we reach for the scalpel and before we reach for uh, any sort of advanced imaging techniques. Does anybody want to hazard a guess what I'm trying to nudge you towards? Uh, joint tap. So you could do a joint tap. A joint tap will certainly tell you a lot more about things like whether we're dealing with something like a synovial sarcoma, uh, septic arthritis. But again, I think probably the joint is not the, the primary cause of this patient's lameness based on the radiographs at least. So remember that we that the differentials that we've described are nasty tumours. So where what else are we going to do? Chest radiographs I'm seeing is coming in on the chat. So yes, absolutely. Well done, Andrea. That's completely right. So before we do anything else with this patient, and this is a rule of thumb for all diseases where or all manifestations where we feel neoplasia is a very uh, a very realistic differential, um, then we have to consider thoracic radiographs. Uh, lateral, so two lateral thoracic radiographs, ideally under general anaesthetic with a patient 
um, either breathing in or if you can control breathing with general anesthesia so you can inflate the lungs, uh, that's ideal. If you want to add a dorsoventral or a ventrodorsal radiograph to that, feel free, but it's the two lateral radiographs that are the most important. This patient did have thoracic mets. Uh, I haven't got the, the, chest rate, the chest CT here, but I thought I'd just show you the extent of disease given on the CT. So we can see that the femoral condyles are actually relatively normal. There are these little changes here, these subchondral erosions, which are a manifestation of degenerative joint disease. But actually, the joint itself, there's um, increase in synovial effusion, but it looks relatively normal. As we come down into the proximal tibia, we can see that there's quite a lot of, of bone missing from the tibial plateau, or just the, the immediately subchondral bone to the tibial plateau. And then we have these punctate lucencies spreading through the, um, uh, the tibial uh, epicondyle, and then down into the majority of the metaphysis of the tibia. We're starting to see this irregular periosteal reaction, which is extremely difficult to see on the radiographs. And actually, even this kind of amorphous periosteal reactions extending quite some distance into the soft tissues uh, away from the joint. The head of the fibula is indeed abnormal, so we can see there's, there's um, a cortical destruction on the axial aspect and also some medullary disruption and lysis there. So this would be uh, fitting with uh, a primary bone tumour. We can see there's also this amorphous periosteal reaction ex extending quite some distance down the limb. Uh, so this would be fitting with a, with a primary bone tumour uh, and indeed this patient had an osteosarcoma. Any questions on case five? Lovely, okay, so last case of the evening and then we can all go have dinner or do whatever it is that we're going to do. This is a one, main, one month, sorry, one year, seven month old female Pomeranian with an acute onset of tachypnea. Quite challenging radiographs. Uh, so um, does anybody want to have a go at them? I shall throw down the gauntlet. Who fancies a challenge? Caesar looks like he is volunteering again, so let's see if he can follow up his prowess on case one with case six. Caesar, it's up to you. Hello. <clears throat> okay. Um, so we've got a right lateral and a dorsal ventral view of the thorax. Um, looks like the, um, the animal might be a bit overweight. On the right lateral view, again, this kind of like an ill-defined radiolucent area, ventral to the cardiac silhouette, um, displacing uh, this dorsally, and this area extends from the um, thoracic inlet to the um, diaphragm. Um, on the right lateral view, there is a singular large uh, gas opacity with some like soft tissue uh, wall, thin uh, soft tissue wall, um, kind of uh, standing from cranial to the carina to almost the diaphragm. Um, from the uh, ventral part of the thoracic vertebra to the mid chest. Um, there is a marked uh, left mediastinal shift on the dorsoventral. Um, an overall, well, there is retraction of the, of the lung lobes, I think, mainly on, on the right side. Um, I think overall the uh, lungs look uh, quite radiolucent and the diaphragm is markedly flattened uh, on, the, on the lateral view. And I think the esophagus, lymph nodes, lower vessels are not very well visualized and I couldn't see anything else on the thorax. And on the abdomen, the, the stomach is uh, moderately dilated with some like ingesta mineral opacities and, and some gas. So in, in conclusion, I think there is a right uh, unilateral tension pneumothorax 
likely due to bullius emphysema. I think that's the um, the only differential that I came up with. Um, yeah, I think that's that's all. Very, very good. Does anybody have anything to add? So tricky set of radiographs, this. Um, if we go back to the history, acute onset of tachypnea in a very young dog. So we've got no history of trauma, or at least uh, I haven't provided you with any history of trauma, and that's because there was no history of trauma. Um, and so uh, we've got patient that has changes that are consistent with the pneumothorax, as Caesar's described. So uh, we've got dorsal deviation of the of the cardiac silhouette, and uh, indeed our first set of cases, our first case this evening, uh, appeared very similarly, if you remember. So dorsal displacement of the cardiac silhouette, retraction of the lung lobes away from the margins of the uh, of the chest of the pleural cavity, all consistent with. Um, uh, uh, a pneumothorax. What's bothering me about this radiograph is the thing that's right slap bang in the middle of it, and that is this thing. Uh, so Caesar described this, this very, very well demarcated, very thin walled, apparently gas filled structure that's sitting superimposed on the cardiac silhouette. Uh, superimposed on portions of the caudal lung fields. So let's move on to the to the uh, dorsal ventral, and we can see that the the the, uh, the hemithoraces couldn't be more different. We've got very very marked mediastinal shift to the left. The cardiac silhouette is compressed all the way over here, smashed over to the left hand side, and a dramatic oversize of the right um, the right hemithorax. And we know that a portion of this has got to be pneumothorax. We know that because we can see that on the lateral radiograph. And indeed, it's highly likely that the gas extending all the way down here is not actually over uh, overinflated lung. Far more likely, it's gas within the pleural cavity. So if you remember, the diaphragm uh, will extend all the way cordially to about the level of L1, L2. Um, and so if we fill the pleural cavity with gas, that's how far cordially the gas is going to go. So here's our structure again. And the question is, what is it? So it looks like a structure that has no air, uh, so has no lung markings in it, but it is kind of the shape of a lung. So, uh, or, or certainly a lung lobe. So I think you can see, if we imagine this is our hemithorax, so this is the uh, the unilateral pneumothorax that we're that we're uh, describing. Um, this is a portion of lung, and it's got a kind of characteristic shape, a kind of lung lobe shape, and it's kind of characteristic of one particular lung lobe. Does anybody want to um, have a guess which lung lobe that might represent? We see the right middle. That's absolutely right, yeah. So it's this kind of sort of ellipsoid shape, which is the, the shape of the right middle lung lobe. So it's in the right place to be a right, a, a right middle lung lobe, but and it's the right shape to be a right middle lung lobe, but it's not the right opacity to be a lung lobe, um, and it's far too big to be a lung lobe. So either it's not a lung lobe, and I'm leading you up the garden path, or it is a lung lobe, but it's grossly abnormal. Let's go back to our history. This is a very young patient with an acute history of tachypnea, so probably an acute pneumothorax. So if we've got a very young patient that has an abnormal lung lobe and a pneumothorax, the chances are that it is actually representative of a, normal, of a, of a lung lobe and not uh, some other structure. So then we need to start to think about what, what might cause a lung lobe to cause a pneumothorax and what might cause a lung lobe to appear this way. Uh, and in a young patient, clearly we're going to be thinking about congenital diseases. Uh, and one disease that we tend to see in, um, in, particularly in small and toy breed dogs, is something called congenital lobar emphysema. And a lobar emphysema is where, instead of our patient having a lung lobe that's composed of multiple tiny little 
balloon-like alveoli. They don't have any alveoli, they just have a lung lobe, which is a gigantic uh, thin-walled uh, bulla or uh, balloon of gas. And if you know that, then it becomes much easier. So would that make the right middle lobe appear much less opaque than we'd expect? Yes. Would it make it appear larger than we'd expect? Absolutely yes. Uh, and would it appear thin-walled and, and relatively radiolucent? Then yes. So all of those three things fit. So Caesar mentioned a tension pneumothorax. That's a really, really good suggestion. It's a unilateral uh, pneumothorax and certainly when we see tension pneumothoraces they tend to be unilateral. Uh, the reason that they tend to be unilateral is if you see a bilateral tension pneumothorax that's not really compatible with life so they don't tend to live long enough for you to be able to manage a, to get a radiograph. If this was a tension pneumothorax we wouldn't expect to see a big right middle lung lobe, we'd expect to see a tiny right middle lung lobe and we'd expect all of the lung lobes to be sat over here somewhere squashed up um, because of the increased uh, pleural pressure. So a congenital abnormality, a congenital expansion of a lung lobe uh, seems more likely in this case. This patient did go on to have a CT uh, and indeed did have a congenital lobar emphysema affecting only the right middle lung lobe. Uh, the patient had a, a, a thoracotomy and the lung lobe removed and recovered uh, uneventfully. That was a really uh, excellent suggestion and uh, well thought out described radiograph Caesar, well done. So that brings me to the end of this uh, webinar. Um, apologi apologies to anybody who hasn't managed to tune in. Uh, sorry, just a couple of questions over this, um, uh, this last case. Um, was a dog born with low emphysema, but then some sort of mild trauma causes a rupture and causes a pneumothorax is, is a question. Uh, yes, that's exa exactly right. So they start with a relatively mild emphysema and relatively small lung lobe, but it will expand and it will expand and it will expand and often will either spontaneously rupture just because the dog takes a deep breath in or there may be a very, very low grade trauma uh, that actually causes a perforation and then the pneumothorax. So, sorry, just brings me to the end of, uh, of our first um, evening film reading uh, radiology workshop, remote workshop. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it and found this useful. I'm sorry there seem to be a few people that haven't made uh, contact. Uh, if you know any of these people, we will contact them personally anyway. Um, and again, this webinar has been recorded so, uh, so you can review it. Thank you very much for uh, attending and thank you very much for your participation. I uh, hope to see you again, same time, next month. Thank you very much.